Now, that's one area in archaeology that I find fascinating. Yes. And so I thought it would be interesting to you, for your audience to talk a little bit about some of those parallels and uh, to, to show, yeah, what was their view of creation? What was their view of other gods? What was their view of the flood? Yes. And we'll see that there are many things that are, that are identical. And then we have to step back and ask the question, how in the world do we explain these similarities? And that's where the interesting answers come in. And the function of the patriarchs in that pagan culture. Yes. And how they were affected by yes. it. Yes. But yet how they remain true to the Absolutely. God of creation. Absolutely. And the God of redemption. Yeah, yeah. Abraham was in no way, Abram was in no way sheltered from the pagan world that he lived in. His father, the scriptures say, was an idolater. Certainly. And so he, he, lived, he lived in a, in a world that was, was just completely controlled by the pagan culture. And we can learn about the God that, that controlled his city and about the beliefs that the people held to, to see just how radical it was to, to follow this Yahweh to a place unknown. And a price to pay at the same Absolutely. time. Absolutely. So what, what I thought would be the best way to begin really discussing this matter is to talk about, yes, archaeology in the Bible and pagan proofs for truth. Yes. And uh, to go into some background information. Let's do it. And in going into the background information, we're going to look at cuneiform tablets. And these are these tablets. The cuneiform is a script again. It was written with a wedge-shaped reed, and it was, it was imprinted or impressed on a, on a um, wet piece of clay. Uh, we know more about a day in the life of the patriarch Abraham than we do about a day in the life of Abraham Lincoln, just because of the sources that survived. Yes. So yes. it's, it's remarkable because we have these clay sources, just so how much is out there? Over 500,000 tablets, I think I mentioned earlier, yes. have survived, and, and we'll see that that's only a small portion of what's been excavated. Now, when it comes to archaeology, a lot of people think with archaeology that they have all the answers, that, that they know it all, they're brilliant, they, they have all the answers and everything, but really uh, they're biased, they're influenced by uh, government and pol politics and religion and money and all sorts oh, of yes. things. And I wanted to just point out briefly on this placard, without going into real great detail on each point, to say, in 1978, students were sent out in Iraq to go around and to count different sites where people lived, ancient sites. Now, students are going to do a pretty good job, but they're not going to do, you know, they're not going to do the best of all jobs. They're going to do the best they can, my knowing students. <laughs> right, yes. that's right. So um, they tabulated a certain number of sites. Of those sites, a certain percentage have been excavated. The shocking thing is that under 1% of the sites in Iraq have been published. Even the known sites? Uh, under 1% of the known sites yes. have been published. That's shocking. It, it, is, it is Israel's worse. In Egypt, it's even worse. Oh, I know. I, I've, I've worked extensively in Israel, uh -huh. and, and you can't drop a spade because you're going to hit another site. Right, right, right. Well, that's absolutely true. So, so when I, the, the, point, the point that I always try to emphasize to my students, and I would so to, the, to, the, to your viewers as well, and to hold dear to their hearts, is that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Yes. Meaning, don't let somebody point their finger in your nose and say, you don't have any proof for such and such. The, the fact of the matter is, we may not. And, and that's perfectly all right. But uh, what we already have oh, is... Yeah, it's amazing. It, it's pyramidal. It, it's right. overwhelming. Right. Yes. Right. And yet, and new things will be discovered. Uh, we only have 1%. So if it's pyramidal, we're only at the top of the pyramid. Yes. So that's the idea yes, behind the this. Base. And, and archaeology is the science of discovery. Yes. Now, all science is discovery, yes. but archaeology especially. Yes. We only have a couple of minutes remaining. Give us a succinct statement about the first point, and then we'll simply have to get together again. I will. I will. Let, let, me, let me tell you how important it was 
the discovery of the and decipherment of cuneiform. I mean, this was a huge discovery. And being able to decipher it, the place that actually, the guy who did it, his name was Henry Rawlinson, he risked his life to do it. It's too long of a story to go into, but, but it entails a 270-foot cliff, a one-foot ledge, standing on the top of a ladder, holding, holding a notebook oh, in his nice. hand, copying down inscriptions and Arrows. saying the, the thrill of the discovery did away with every, any sense of danger. Yes. And this particular place that he made this discovery can't be read today because of the sandstorms and things like that. So really... Once the exposure is made, unfortunately, deterioration sets in. Absolutely. So as you and I discussed before the program, often the sites are covered over yes. uh, simply with the right. dirt and sand. Right. Because right. you can't build a monument on all of them, right. even right. the one percent right. that has That's been right. discovered even in Iraq. That's right. And the best way to preserve it is to cover it over. There, but what this leaves us with then are a number of ancient archives have been discovered. Uh, like ancient, uh, if people have seen One Night with the King, uh, the story of Esther, she reads from different scrolls that were collections of writings of daily happenings of the kings and things. And we have references to those kinds of things in the Old Testament. Well, there are collections from major cities that have been discovered in royal treasuries that include all, ki all kinds of things. Um, they include names of cities that are in the Bible. Yes, like the Ebla uh, tablets. Absolutely. Uh, biblical names. The first uh, mention of David, etc., yeah, etc. Yeah, so these, these kinds of things open up to us a whole world of substantiation of the Bible. Dr. Carroll has opened to us a world of research and discovery, and time has just flown before we knew what was going on. But he has made some very succinct points. One being that the ancient discoveries that are being made on papyrus, cuneiform, uh, in actual archaeological discovery of sites, actually verify the biblical record and the culture as described, even though sometimes that's an abbreviated description, in the Bible, the Word of God, which shows that it was with, the Bible was written with the color of the background that we can research in archaeology. But now, the major point that he made was that the Bible gives us the answers that these people were searching for. Jesus Christ came not only to give you the answer, but to be your answer. He walked with us. We crucified him. He was buried. He rose again, and he lives right now, asking entrance into your heart. Would you pray this simple prayer with me? Just pray it from your heart. Lord Jesus, at this moment, I receive you as my personal Savior. Step into my heart, forgive my sins, cover me with your blood. I will serve you with all my heart. Creation in the 21st Century has been sponsored by Trinity Broadcasting Network. And only with your love gift of support can this program stay on the air. So write to Creation in the 21st Century, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana.